Salieri, and so many great artists have their unchallenged and unaccountable nemesis in the arts business. Van Gogh had Tiersteeg. Vincent often complains and laments about this particular man's personal bias and prejudice towards him, and of his resulting professional dilemma, seemingly incorrigible, in his writings. Throughout our presentation today, we will hear in Vincent's own words the attempts he continually made to reach out to this life and career-giving impresario. We will observe how Tiersteeg's personal prejudices translated into sheer blindness as to his abilities to judge Vincent's work objectively, leaving Vincent continually struggling for the basic necessities of his life. So, along with my spare interjections, I speak today for Vincent van Gogh, through his own words taken from the hundreds of letters written throughout his life and artistic quest to his younger brother and sole mentor, Theo. Hello, and welcome to the online performance studio's presentation of Vincent van Gogh in words, music, and art. Vincent van Gogh, even the word Vincent, evokes in many of us the quietest, momentary pause. His name alone creates a certain void, a small emptiness and a unique feeling tinged with sadness, helplessness, confusion, or even that of collective guilt. We all know something of his story, and that simple name conjures up a tragic figure, a severely misunderstood mastermind, and as history, or perhaps the arts industry itself would have it, Vincent represents the eternal suffering artist, the suicidal, the maniacal, fanatical, demented, self-destructive artist, a crazed man who would go to whatever means necessary to produce his work. More concisely, he was simply an aspiring, unrelenting artist and visionary who sold only one of the many hundreds of paintings created in his lifetime. Very simply, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had the highest artistic ideals and led a selfless life of purpose and duty in a profession which, he says, after all, has poetry as its end. Vincent went far beyond the fashionable idea of a bohemian lifestyle. As an artist, he truly walked the walk. As a human being, Vincent van Gogh possessed the deepest sense of and appreciation for humanity and mankind. The only thing I want you not to doubt is my goodwill, he writes. He found the greatest beauty in the smallest moments in our everyday mundane existence. As an artist, he recreated and reinterpreted these very moments through a meticulous technical foundation combined with a pure, untainted, and unadulterated artistic vision. But despite all his accomplishments in art, which seem to us now to be so very profound, beautiful, visionary, groundbreaking, and blatantly obvious. Here is a man who was blindly overlooked in his own lifetime, not by his peers and colleagues, but by the people and powers that be within the arts industry, powers who operated as much or more on personal prejudices and inherited biases than on objectivity who were chronically subjected in their judgments to a point where a truly talented artist such as Vincent van Gogh was overlooked entirely, sinking into despair and poverty. Through Vincent's writings, he often mentions the industry's prejudices against him, but it seems that one certain impresario and artist's liaison named H.G. Tiersteeg stood out more so than the several others mentioned. Tiersteeg a man who quite clearly held the reins for Vincent's livelihood and localized career. How did Vincent van Gogh's professional fate fall into nearly one man's dictatorship? How could one man make or break the career of Vincent van Gogh? In today's presentation, we will examine and understand more about this particular arts administrator. 
and of his abusive, prejudicial actions towards Vincent through Vincent van Gogh's actual writings. Although historically labeled a madman by the industry, Vincent was extremely civil, clear, and level-headed in his extensive letter writings. These chronicles leave little doubt that Vincent was indeed driven to madness, striking out against the industry which discriminated against him and against the society which supported it. Today, you will realize that the unscrupulous leg legacy which has been left to Vincent's name is perhaps unjust. For as Mozart had Salieri, and so many great artists Hello, have their and welcome to the online unaccountable studio 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 presentation of business. Vincent Van Gogh had tears to music and art. Vincent often complains Vincent Van Gogh laments about this even particular man's personal bias, and many prejudice. of us to quiet his and of his resulting loss. professional His name alone creates a certain void in his writings. A small writings. emptiness and a Throughout our presentation today, we will hear of Vincent's helplessness the attempt for even that continually made to guilt. reach out to this life. We all know something of his story, and that simple way we observed how a tragic figure, a severely misunderstood mastermind, blind and as his to his abilities to judge the arts industry itself would have it, leaving Vincent continually struggling for the basic necessities of his life. The suicidal, the so, along with my spare interjections, I speak today for a crazed man who would go whatever means necessary to hundreds of letters written throughout his life more concisely. Artistic he was simply an aspiring, brother, unrelenting artist and visionary who yeah. sold only one of the many hundreds of paintings created in his lifetime. Very simply, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had the highest artistic ideals and led a selfless life of purpose and duty in a profession which, he says, after all, has poetry as its end. Vincent went far beyond the fashionable idea of a bohemian lifestyle. As an artist, he truly walked the walk. As a human being, Vincent van Gogh possessed the deepest sense of and appreciation for humanity and mankind. The only thing I want you not to doubt is my goodwill, he writes. He found the greatest beauty in the smallest moments in our everyday mundane existence. As an artist, he recreated and reinterpreted these very moments through a meticulous technical foundation combined with a pure, untainted, and unadulterated artistic vision. But despite all his accomplishments in art, which seem to us now to be so very profound, beautiful, visionary, groundbreaking, and blatantly obvious, here is a man who was blindly overlooked in his own lifetime, not by his peers and colleagues, but by the people and powers that be within the arts industry, powers who operated as much or more on personal prejudices and inherited biases than on objectivity, who were chronically subjective in their judgments to a point where a truly talented artist such as Vincent van Gogh was overlooked entirely, sinking into despair and poverty. Through Vincent's writings, he often mentions the industry's prejudices against him, but it seems that one certain impresario and artist's liaison named H.G. Tiersteeg stood out more so than the several others mentioned. Tiersteeg, a man who quite clearly held the reins for Vincent's livelihood and localized career. How did Vincent van Gogh's professional fate fall into nearly one man's dictatorship? How could one man make or break the career of Vincent van Gogh? In today's presentation, we will examine and understand more about this particular arts administrator and of his abusive, prejudicial actions towards Vincent through Vincent van Gogh's actual writings. Although historically labeled a madman by the industry, Vincent was extremely civil, clear, and level-headed in his extensive letter writings. These chronicles leave little doubt that Vincent was indeed driven to madness, striking out against the industry which discriminated against him and against the society which supported it. 
Today, you will realize that the unscrupulous leg legacy which has been left to Vincent's name is perhaps unjust. For as Mozart had Salieri, and so many great artists have their unchallenged and unaccountable nemesis in the arts business, Van Gogh had Tierstieg. Vincent often complains and laments about this particular man's personal bias and prejudice towards him, and of his resulting professional dilemma, seemingly incorrigible, in his writings. Throughout our presentation today, we will hear in Vincent's own words the attempts he continually made to reach out to this life and career-giving impresario. We will observe how Tierstieg's personal prejudices translated into sheer blindness as to his abilities to judge Vincent's work objectively, leaving Vincent continually struggling for the basic necessities of his life. So, along with my spare interjections, I speak today for Vincent van Gogh, through his own words taken from the hundreds of letters written throughout his life and artistic quest to his younger brother and sole mentor, Theo. I was interrupted these days by my toiling on a new picture representing the outside of a night cafe. On the terrace, there are tiny figures of people drinking. An enormous yellow lantern sheds its light on the terrace, the house front, and the sidewalk, and even casts a certain brightness on the pavement of the streets, which takes a pinkish violet tone. The gable-topped fronts of the houses in the street, stretching away under a blue sky spangled with stars, are dark blue or violet, and there is a green tree. Here you have a night picture without any black in it, done with nothing but beautiful blue and violet and green and citron yellow color. It amuses me enormously to paint the night right on the spot. They used to draw and paint pictures in the daytime after the rough sketch, but I find satisfaction in painting things immediately. Of course, it's true that in the dark, I may mistake a blue for a green, a blue lilac for a pink lilac, for you cannot rightly distinguish the quality of a hue. But it is the only way to get rid of the conventional night scenes with their poor, shallow, whitish light, whereas a simple candle already gives us the richest yellows and orange tints.
From where did this great and deserving artist emerge? Vincent was born under the sign of Aries, near the Belgian border of the Netherlands, March 30th, 150 years ago. The eldest of the four surviving children, his family's first child, who was also to be named Vincent, died stillborn exactly one year to the day earlier in 1852. It surprises many to know that after unsuccessful attempts at being a young art dealer, where, ironically, Tiersti was his distant superior, even sending Vincent's parents good reports about his abilities and enthusiasm for the job, Vincent's first and earliest professional passion became that of aspiring to be an evangelical lay minister of God. He pursued this course for nearly four years, following in his father's footsteps and going to Amsterdam in 1877 for studies, and while there serving, without pay for instance, communities of oppressed coal miners. He tries to put into practice the Christian ideals that inspired him by giving away all of his possessions and choosing to reside in a hovel, sleeping on the straw. Vincent's father was a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church who strongly believed that those most worthy of God's grace were the lowly workmen and the poor, who were endowed with a natural spiritual advantage because of their humility and modest lifestyle. Indeed, Vincent now shows us new facets of our own God. But four years later in 1880, at the age of 23, he finds his theological studies difficult and irrelevant because of their emphasis on Greek, Latin, and mathematics. Vincent then makes the momentous decision to become a painter, noting in his writings, an artist needn't be a clergyman or a church warden, but he certainly must have a warm heart for his fellow men. He refers often in his letters to quelque chose en eau, and he fervently admired religious painters such as Rembrandt, who represented the mission of Christ in his artwork and the place of an almighty God in the overall meaning of our lives. It is never to be doubted that Vincent held an unshakable belief in a much higher being, one who certainly displaces the Tierstieg Salieri figure within the arts industry. This higher faith, historically, lends truest humility as well as a very certain excellence and impeccable caliber to many of the greatest artists' work, which we now enjoy so much in our everyday lives. My house here is painted the yellow color of fresh butter on the outside with glaringly green shutters. It stands in the full sunlight in a square which has a green garden with plane trees, oleanders, and acacias. And it is completely whitewashed inside, and the floor is made of red bricks. And over it there is the intensely blue sky. In this, I can live and breathe, meditate and paint. Here, I feel much better than I did in Paris.